best entertainment on the earth. Tune in for Comics with Birch. Hey everybody, this is Birch and I'm here with Joe. And, and Joe, this is a moment we've been waiting for for a long time. We're here with uh, Mark Miller. Mark, how are you? Doing good, thanks. Doing great. I, I, I'm very excited to talk to you, obviously, you know, huge fan of your work and, and just, uh, yeah, just been very interested to hear what you think about the, about the current industry and, and you have some projects coming up, some, th some things that we want to talk about, right? Yeah, it's funny actually because my, my nose is so close to the grindstone, I, I just realized I haven't done an interview in ages, you know, like absolutely ages, so it's fun, you know, so the podcasts I like. You know, I'm actually like, let's do, let's do some interviews, this is great. And it's so weird, you know, from a few years ago when I was full-time in comics, um, everything was written down. You know, you would do an interview yeah. and then it was transcribed. Um, and it's so different now. You know, I, I kind of miss, you know, those 32-page interviews with a, with a comic pro. I used to love all that yeah. stuff. It was great. But the, but the podcast is that for us now, isn't it? You know, well, we're doing something else. You know, we're, we're, we're listening to these, which is, which is great. It's a lot easier than transcribing. Yeah, it is. But I miss the uh, I miss the old days. I miss uh, I, I I miss doing it in person this disembodied uh, yeah. Zoom like yeah. Yeah, interview. I, I'm still it's, yeah. several years into it with the pandemic. I hate it. So yeah. well, the, the thing is weird for me is no one understands what I'm saying. So a podcast <laughs> is, is really weird. You know, like I, I just said like a, a demon or something <laughs> like that. To people, and then luckily there's an American helping out. You know? Uh, but but speaking of the old days, though, um, I'm seeing her next week, and she's going to ask me what you said about her. So, uh, yeah. well, what do you have to say uh, to Martha Thomas's? Oh, she's she'll probably listen. I, you know, she's uh, she's one of my very few comic book Facebook friends. Like, I try and keep Facebook to just my family and people I went to school with and everything. But Martha was one of those people that crept into this of like somebody you just saw as like a cousin or something. She's like yeah. the nicest woman in the world, you know, and, and DC, I mean, the, the years I was at DC, um, I met some really nice people. I didn't have a great time when I was there, but like, uh, but, the, but the actual staff, there was a lot of just really lovely people who were like old school comic fans, you know, people who just grew yeah. up. There was nothing, there was no stepping stone to Hollywood or anything like that. It was like all they ever dreamed of doing was comic books. And that was Martha, you know, she was probably... The only kid for you know miles around who was reading comics and everything, and 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 DC was kind of full of people like that. Then you know it was it was great, and then we all met each other, which was wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. she, she told us one of the when we we talked to her and now more than a year ago, and she one of the best stories included you. She was talking about the two of you at San Diego Comic Con, and just I, I yeah. Joe, how did there was some, something boring was going on, and you just <laughs> created your own entertainment there. No, I, I think that's, I, I heard this and it's slightly misremembered. I can tell you the true story of what happened uh, there, you know, because I would, I would everybody's that. drunk, so nobody remembers the real story. What it was was um, Grant Morrison and I were sitting with some people who were talking like business, and it was actually really serious, you know, and we just wanted to talk about, you know, Superman or something, you know, and everybody was talking about like paper costs or something really grown up, you know, and we were saying <laughs> to each other, I'll give you five bucks. If you can run to that building over there and get back here inside ninety seconds, and he was like, "Okay," so we were, <laughs> we were, we were just to keep us occupied during the meeting, and it'd be like, "I'll give you ten dollars if you can commando crawl under five tables and get back here inside one hundred and twenty seconds." So they were like, "These guys are idiots," you know. But I think this was uh, this was how we got through boring meetings, and I think that's what Martha was like. Why are these guys running when we should be sitting here talking? <laughs> <laughs> Is it, not to not to jump right into it, but but these are the the memories I have of comics. Particularly, you go back ten years or so, uh, both in the retail shops and the conventions. There there was there was fun. There was a lot more kind of irreverent uh, love. It 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 feels like the the more and but you're the exception. The more we've gotten into Hollywood, the more that there's been this hook into things. It's yeah. it feels like people are less likely, less interested in having fun. Uh, is that is it you just me? Is have I gotten too dark <laughs> with it? You know we. I, we always have a great time, you know. So like, like I've never, I've never gone to a having a great time, you know. But, but I remember the very first convention I heard about when I was thirteen, and I heard there was a convention in Glasgow, like the the city near where I grew up in Scotland. And I remember hearing that the comic guys and sci-fi guys, the two things were kind of the same thing back in those days. It was a comic book science fiction convention when I was a teenager. Um, you know, these were kids who kind of read all this stuff, and again, were, there was no internet, so you only met once a year kind of about these things, and everybody became fast friends. And I remember hearing when I was 13, one of my friend's brothers went to one, and there was somebody who stayed in the elevator the whole time with a giant 
casket of booze, you know, like, and and nobody was allowed in the elevator to get up to the room unless they downed a pint of beer, you know, and like my friend's brother was 15 years old, you know, and he was like, he was drunk at a comic book convention, you know, and and he and when he went up to his room to get something, he had to down a pint of beer and everything. And I was like, I, this is the world I want to be in. When I was older, it just it always sounded like fun. And I've always seen yeah. people do adult kind of jobs, like important things, you know. And and I've always tried to avoid it my entire life and just live that lifestyle of just having a good time, whether it's at work or outside of work. Good for you, yeah. And I know that. I mean, the, the secret is that I was that guy in the elevator with the booze. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I was I, I, sorry for bouncing around, but I I, I was listening to uh, an interview of yours a couple of days ago, and they were talking to you yeah. about uh, coming in, doing the ultimate line, and everything else. And you you told the story; it stuck with me of you know Ultimate X Men and everything that happened there, and ultimately and what you did with the Ultimates. You know, very popular, yeah. very successful, wound up being a template for things. But you yeah. told this story about when you were when you were doing this, you when you first started cracking these characters, you got the characters wrong, or you, you made a comment about you had Wolverine flying or something. You you didn't you, you, <laughs> yes. in your first pitch, and yeah. and yet people. It, it, so first, I, I love the freedom of that. You just you came in, and you're thinking about a good story and what could do yeah. with the characters, and but it's it, this this run is super well remembered. What was this true? You 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 just went for it with the characters before you even <laughs> knew where the powers were aligned. Yeah, what it was was um, like the, the Avengers characters, the Ultimates characters, I knew very well. You know, like I, I really understood them. X Men was always a mystery to me. And I'll tell you why it's, it's quite odd is that I grew up in the 80s, but I was reading 1960s comics. So it was, yeah. it was really odd. It's because distribution in the UK wasn't brilliant for American Marvel comics. So we used to get black and white reprints in Scotland of American comics. But sometimes they, sometimes they were three or four years out of date. But sometimes they were 20 years out of it, you know. So, okay. so I was growing up reading, I mean, it was amazing. I was growing up reading Jack Kirby, Fantastic Four, and uh, Steve Ditko's Spider-Man, which is like the best education anybody yeah. wanting to work in comics could possibly have. So it was wonderful. But what it meant was I hadn't discovered Wolverine yet. You know, like Wolverine, Wolverine, what, I mean, <laughs> even, though I, even though I was reading Marvel in 1983, Wolverine hadn't happened for me yet. You know, so I, I was totally unaware of the characters. So like my X-Men was like, written by Roy Thomas and drawn by Werner Roth or something, you know, so like, yeah. so it's so, so out of date. Um, so then they said to me, do you want to take over Ultimate X-Men? Because I'd, ha I'd had my first big hit after years of bobbing around, you know, um, I'd had my first big hit with the authority and Marvel said, well, Joe, Joe Quesada had just become boss at Marvel and he and Bill Jameis were like, we've got Brian Bendis, who's an interesting young new writer coming in doing Spider-Man, would you like to do X-Men? And it's a team book, and you can see the similarities potentially with the authority, and it's a group dynamic, it's superheroes and everything. And I was so desperate for money, you know, like I was, this was like my first break, you know, and I was so keen to get into Marvel. I was like, yeah, I know everything about the X Men. And <laughs> I, I, I just wrote this story, and for some reason, I, I don't think I had him flying, but I had him lifting a car. I thought his adamantium skeleton would mean he was really strong, and I had him hitting somebody with a car or something. And then the X Men movie came out about a month later, and I was like, "All oh, right, I get it, right?" You know. So then I understood, you know, what the X Men was. Well, but that, that's, that's so true. But I was blagging, you know, that's a British word, you know. I was I was just desperately trying to get in, and I would have done anything to to write these books. You know, you know it's, it's I, I, funny though with the uh, with the Ultimates because my brother James, he's five yeah. years younger than me, um, so he, he was a kid. He was in. Uh, maybe like uh, middle school or something at the time and, yeah. and subscribed uh, to, you know, uh, ultimates for issue one. And he made yeah. sure to get it in on time, but uh, Marvel had some, there was a hiccup. So yeah. he was waiting and waiting for the mail to come. It didn't come. And then it didn't start till issue two. So mm -hmm. my mom helped him write a letter to Marvel <laughs> yeah. to send, to get issue, you know, like one or, or something. So they mailed, a copy of issue one that was signed by you. Oh, really? And, wow. and my brother opens it and he's all sad. And we're like, what's wrong? He's like, it's signed. I can't read it now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only writer that devalues a book by, by signing it. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't, I don't, this is weird because I, I think I remember when I signed that. And what it was was <laughs> Bill Jameis said to me and Bendis, would you guys mind signing like 10 copies of some books that we have lying around? We're going to give us prizes or whatever, you know? 
And it's the only time I ever signed a copy of anything in the Marvel office, and I signed 10 copies of Ultimates. What? So you, your brother must have been one of those copies. That's crazy. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I there's a fan friendly approach to that that kind of stuff that I think do you think like being owned by the corporations or owned by now it's just harder for them to pull that stuff off yeah oh definitely I mean I left Marvel around about the time Disney came in you know and <clears throat> and it was a big decision you know I mean like Marvel was uh you know an awesome guy had a brilliant time there and everything but I did have that feeling you know you know like when you're in Europe in World War II and you can see the the army's approaching, <laughs> and, you know, like, I think, it's, I think it's kind of time to get out of Paris, time to get out of Paris, you know, like, I don't think I would have enjoyed Disney Marvel, you know, like, it just, uh, it, a lot of my friends stayed on and had a good time, and there was some good books done in that time, but, like, I think the kind of person I am, plus, you know, my my own company was taking off at the time, I'd, I've been doing both at the same time, like, I started the company in 2000, uh, December 2003 with Wanted, and, because I was under contract doing Marvel things, that even though I'd had a big movie deal and everything, I couldn't leave because I was under contract for a while. So I had a great time. I loved it. But I just knew this is the time to go. You know, I'd sold more movies. Kick-Ass was getting made and everything. It's, okay, it's, it's, it's time to head, you know. Um, but I think, you know, I think if I'd hung around, I'd have got bored as well. You know, like, I, I'm a great believer in getting off the stage. Like, Joe couldn't believe, Joe Quesada couldn't believe I was leaving Ultimates when it was, like, a top mm -hmm. three book. You know, like, we... We sold over 100,000 copies of every issue, um, and it was, you know, obviously hugely influential and everything. Um, but I think that's the time to go, you know. And oh yeah, and I, I, and I didn't, I didn't write the Old Man Logan sequel. I just wrote Old Man Logan. You know, I created the Marvel Zombies. I didn't want to go on and do more things. You know, I like being there at the beginning when something's new and interesting, and then I love to fire myself and go and do something else. It's just so much more interesting. I didn't want to write Civil War Two. I'd written Civil War, you know, so. So I, I think getting out around about 2009 was was wise for me. Yeah, it certainly was good for your career. I mean, you, you you've gone on to do pretty amazing things. Well, yeah, it was. I mean, it was the right place, right time. You know, there's a Forrest Gump, Zelig kind of idiot luck to uh, in a lot of ways as well. You know, but but at the same time, Stan Lee um, gave me some really brilliant advice, which was don't miss a great opportunity. <laughs> you know, so so the minute Hollywood were very interested in me, and they were buying up you know, anything I was doing, you know, so it was kind of, I'm not going to turn that down, you know, and I, I, I never really wanted to create my own stuff. I, I got into comics really to do the characters I loved growing up. But then when I started doing it, I really loved it. You know, like I, I really had a great time doing my own stuff. And it, nobody could say, oh, this story makes no sense because in 1979, you know, yeah. Black Cat said this or whatever, you know, it's like that, that stuff drives me nuts where you're trying to write a story like a jigsaw around, a billion years of continuity, you know, an endless number of stories that you haven't read. Um, there's something just so fresh about doing something that's new and just lived in your head. Yeah. 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 Speak, speaking of the early uh, Miller World stuff, uh, uh, yeah. before this, I was uh, going through the unfunnies again. All right. And, um, you, you know, uh, in, in a way, it's... It, 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 it's interesting. How did how did all that come about? Because it's very different from your other early uh, Miller World. I was trying different things. You know, like I'd seen I'd seen a Todd Salons movie called Happiness. You know that movie is is really mm -hmm. brilliant. And nowadays you couldn't do it. You know, you know, because uh, culturally, every thirty years we go through a period where you know you can't do crazy stuff. You know, and we've right. just had ten years of that. You know, but just kind of. Before that, you know, maybe 20 years ago, um, Todd Salons did this movie, Happiness, which broke every time. <laughs> you know, it was like the worst taste movie you could possibly imagine. And I thought, and I was just inspired. I was like, I've got to do a comic like that, you know. And, and I was just yeah. thinking, to do something, what's the darkest story I could possibly write? And how do I make it, you know, because it's quite hard to do horror in comics, you know, because you can't control mood or music in the same way that you can in movies. You know, people are turning the pages at their own pace and so on. And I was like, how can I make this doubly disturbing? So I was like, I'll do it as a funny animal comic, you know, and make it the darkest horror story I've ever written. Uh, but people hated it, you know. I mean, it's, it sold okay. It sold about, I think the first one sold like 13,000 copies or something, which is crazy. Yeah. But like, um, it was too dark for people, you know. They just, people didn't get it. And I was like, okay, I'll go back into, uh, I'll go back into my comfort zone of superhero groups, you know. <laughs> so, it's kind of a bit of a resurgence, though. I mean, it, people are coming back to it now, I've noticed. It's, it's, I'm hearing more and more about it. I, I, I do think we're culturally about to go through something very interesting, and I've felt this for a while. I mean, I'm obsessed with history and obsessed with trends, you know, in, in culture and politics mm -hmm. and economics. And the the one thing that seems to happen in America 
uh, well, in, in the Western world, really, but particularly America, um, is there is a period of book burning. You know, there's a period of moral puritanism that seems to come roughly once every 30 years, you know, where um, in the UK it was, Victor you know, we had it in the 1890s or so with Victoria, Victoriana. You, uh, you had the Hayes Code in Hollywood in the, the early part of the century after pretty outrageous movies in the 20s. Um, but then you have the moral puritanism of the 1950s and you have McCarthyism and so on and witch hunts and things like that. Then you had it again in the 80s, which people kind of forget now, you know, but there is a reason that guys like Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd and all these very, very anti-establishment people were doing essentially children's movies in the 80s, which was, that's the only thing that could get greenlit in the Reagan years, you know? So the 80s was not unlike the 50s. And um, Tarantino talked about this. He, he, he said that, like, um, he was on Joe Rogan. He did a great podcast talking about it where he said that this kind of went from, you know, 1980 or so when you had the post-Star Wars um, after those really interesting late 60s and mid-70s movies. Um, then you had children's movies essentially for a decade and a half. And he said it took till about Reservoir Dogs um, before everything exploded again and you could do crazy stuff. But when that crazy stuff happened, it was so exciting. Do you remember how it felt when you saw Pulp Fiction for the first time and you're like, yeah. We were watching The Goonies a little while ago, and now we're watching Pulp Fiction. This is amazing, you know? Um, and I, I, I think he's right. I think that we're probably a year or so or, or less from this happening again. There's going to be some 29-year-old director, some comic guys who are 27, 28 just now who are like, you know what? I don't care about the Twitter backlash. I'm going to do the craziest stuff imaginable. And it's going to be glorious when it happens because yeah. comics is always at its best when it's a pirate medium. The minute it's super conforming and it's boring, you know, and it's why, you know, we're not talking about that much just now, you know. Um, but when people come in and do crazy stuff again, it's wonderful. I mean, that's what I love about Saga. I love the fact that Saga is just like, you know, batshit, it's crazy, you know, and that's right. what makes it wonderful. It, it, it I, I, so I completely, I mean, we've, and not to spoil, but we, we've talked offline a bit about this, just the cyclical yeah. nature of, of these cycles. And I, I completely agree. Yeah. I think that, in fact, I think the COVID caused it to be overdue a little bit. It, it shuffled the, the deck slightly. I think we're, we're yeah. past, the, yeah. past the date when it normally would have happened, but it's coming very quickly. Yes, that's what happened two years ago. I mean, I, I weirdly predicted it all. Uh, you know, I said in the next 12 months, this is what's going to happen. And then I didn't anticipate a global pandemic, you know, but that basically put the economy and it put culture into a two-year hibernation. I mean, we're watching Top Gun Maverick now, but it was made three years ago, you know, so it's, it's really odd. We're in a very strange place. Yeah. And I, I think that um, it's really interesting because everybody feels it. You can smell it in the air. You know something has changed. Like, things are really different now, I think, from they were three months ago. Like, Top Gun Maverick, I think, was a paradigm shift. Something happened. Yeah. Like, nor normies were like, we can go back to cinema again. This is, this is amazing, you know? Like, yeah. I, I, was at, I was at a barbecue uh, the weekend that Top Gun Maverick came out, and I went to uh, a barbecue on a Sunday afternoon, and I was talking to my normie friends, and they were buzzing about Top Gun in a way that I would have been buzzing about Guardians of the Galaxy or something, you know, like their eyes were just glowing. They were like, it was amazing, you know. And I think we're yeah. just going to start seeing more stuff like that. Again, something that doesn't have a heavy-handed political message and everything, you know, just just a big, fun entertainment aimed at normal people, you know. I think it's uh, I think something's happening, and it's really, and when it happens, it happens really fast. But I think things are going to be very different uh, very soon. I, I agree. I think I do agree. I think that uh, these, these changes, usually you have this year, 18 months of transition, but because I think we're overdue and because of the pandemic, because of everything's written, we reach somewhat of a boiling point. I think that transition is yeah. going to be faster and more jarring than people are yes. used to. I think yeah. by Christmas. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What do you think? So the comic, uh, you know, the comic <laughs> industry in general, these companies, I, I feel like uh, we're, we're, we're also in this period where there's been a, a large number of arrested development kind of moments mm -hmm. happening. And now yeah. this snap is occurring. And so small companies have to adapt in this change. I think it's, it's good that we're going through this change, but it feels yeah. like it's going to be very, very rough for some people. Yes. I think it's good. All, all change is rough when it happens, you know, like comics mm -hmm. tends to go through 20 year cycles as I've talked about in the past, you know, and, and, and even pre pre comics, you know, um, whenever these things were pulps, um, it was kind of the same, you know, uh, the pattern I noticed was that there's kind of new blood comes in roughly every 20 years. Those people tend to be a little bit younger. They tend to be late 20s, maybe yeah. into early 30s. But, you know, there's a few outliers, you know, like guys like Bruce Jones, 
came along uh, 20 years ago and he was he was way older than all of us but doing stuff that was as good as us, you know. But it's like basically a voice you've never heard before appears and revolutionises the industry and they lift all ships at the same time, you know. So, um, you know, Brian and I um, were, were sort of in that pole position in the year 2000, you know, when we came in and did the ultimate line and then we had a lot of big jobs at Marvel and everything. Um, 20 years before that, you know, it was... Uh, Frank Miller, Alan Moore, Marv Wolfman, guys like this, you know, 20 years before that, it was Stan and Jack. 20 years before that, it's Siegel and Schuster, Gardner Fox, uh, and all the Golden Age guys. But then 20 years before that, you know, you, you've got Edgar Rice Burroughs, and, you know, you've, you, you, you have to remember, this is just the way it's been, you know, that people, 20 years before that, it's Sherlock Holmes and Raffles and all those kind of things. So right. roughly every 20 years, somebody comes up with something new and cool. And what I think is really interesting, actually, is we, we seem to be, always looking to reinvent something we loved as children, but it so rarely happens in pop culture. I've been thinking a lot about this recently, and we're always kind of disappointed when something comes back as a reheat and it's not as good as it was. And right. it's kind of self-evident in that it's a reheat. Of course it's not going to taste as good as it was, you know? So these things have cultural peaks. They belong in their own time. And there's only a few characters, I think, exist outside of that. I think that Dracula seems to be open to reinvention regularly and seems to come back pretty big when it does. Not not always uh, enormous, but, but it, it exists. Sherlock Holmes uh, and Batman. But things like Tars and Lone Ranger, all these things, they belong to their era. Star Wars, I think, belongs to its era, but I think a bunch of guys like us who grew up loving Star Wars are desperately trying to bring it back to life, you know, and we're trying to find some way of doing it. But what people love is the original Star Wars movies really and, and yeah. will never be satisfied because they'll never feel the way those things did for America in the post-Vietnam era in 1977 when you needed something that picked you up again, you know? So, like, <clears throat> it's fascinating, you know, I, I, I think there's going to be some young people come in and they're going to do something we've never seen before and that's a good thing. Well, it's interesting you talk about the reheat stuff too because um, some of your work, like, uh, just recently with, like, King of Spies and then, like, a yeah. Starlight, which is a favorite of mine that... Um, yeah, uh, you had done. Uh, you you sort of touch on some of that, those ideas of you know, like someone kind of having to go back to what they were good at years ago, or you know, they're at the end and can they still yeah. be as good? So, that, were those kind of thoughts things that like played into books like that? Or? Oh, massively. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, what on a very simple level, even when I was sixteen years old, when Dark Knight Returns came out, I loved that idea of somebody who was once the world's greatest crime fighter is back for one last job. I mean, it never fails. Unforgiven, it never fails. Something you, somebody you loved coming back and picking up a gun again or whatever and doing something cool, it always works. You know, it's, it's always great. So on, on that level, I like, I quite like write, writing the stories. But also, you can do a postmodern twist or a reinvention. I think you can do that, you know, where I think if you had to come back and do, you know, like Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers or something, you'd struggle. There's a certain amount of cultural baggage with that. Like, I don't know if these movies would work. In the same way that I think The Incredibles took everything that worked about Fantastic Four, but took it to the next level. And that's what I've tried to do with these things. So Starlight is my ode to those old sci-fi pulp things that I loved, but it's got a modern, an entirely modern flavor, you know? So when the movie's getting put together just now by Joe Cornish over at 20th Century, he's going to write, he's written the script and he's directing it but it's going to feel like a big modern movie. It's not going to seem like some odes to 1980s Flash Gordon or to 1979's Buck Rogers or anything like that. You know, it's, it's going to be its own thing. But if you think about it, it's very interesting that what the way these characters live on um, is they are reinvented all the way back to the Greek myths. You know, so Superman and Batman, you can trace them through Doc Savage in the shadow and trace them back further yeah. to Sherlock Holmes and Hercules, you know? So, like, so what you do is you take the essence of something and you reinvent it for the next generation. I think that's that's valid, I think. I think there's that, that keeps the concept alive, even if the character maybe belongs to another time. Like, Superman's my all-time favourite thing in the world. Like, I love it more than any other cultural figure. But I can see how it struggles now, you know, because it represents an America that, is slightly lost, you know, which was the America that was open to people coming in in 1938, you know, the Statue of Liberty is sort of saying, come here and I'll give you shelter, you know, it's like Superman belong. it was a refugee story, you know, um, yeah. and I can see it's, not that America is welcoming now, you know, but the, the 20th century story of America, it was America's century 
you know, we're, we're, we're 10 years away from the Chinese century, 20, maybe 20 years away from the Chinese century. You know, the, the, the Chinese... Maybe two, I don't know. Yeah, maybe two, yeah. The, the, the global empire that America's had for 80 years, you know, is, is drawing to its close. And Superman represented everything that was wonderful about that time, you know. Um, so I think it, it's struggling to find a cultural hook because that time no longer exists. In the same way that the British Empire was 100 years before that, the Portuguese, the French Empire, all these things, they come and they go. Um, but certainly by 2050, it'll be a Chinese-dominated world, and economically, certainly, you know. I, 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 so amazing. You're opening up so many doors to, to go down. Um, I, I'm quite well, curious. It's something so interesting. This is it's too interesting. We're, we're peeking through. It's amazing. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's such a good conversation. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, I'll, I'll put you on the spot with this. So you were one of these persons, as you mentioned yourself, Bendis, uh, back yeah. in 2000 and kind of that era, you were the start of this next cycle yeah. of comics. You brought these new yeah. ideas to the table. And now we find ourselves at the start of another uh, you know, cycle where some new faces yeah. are going to come in, break the mold, do something yeah. different. How? Uh, what's your place in this new cycle? You're, you're obviously still pumping out comics people love. I, I think yeah. the King of Spies that just came out was was extremely well received. I loved it. A, a lot of people oh, did, and and you're 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 very powerful in terms of what you're bringing out. So, how do you best adapt to this new cycle? Do you, do you have a responsibility to help the new people? Do you like what, what's your role in this? Do you think? I think well, my my, my day job really is um, you know I, I sold my company, uh, Mellow World, or we sold our company uh, to uh, Netflix in 2017, and they bought. 17 franchises when they bought that company and it's funny a lot of people are kind of confused by it. you know a lot of people think it's a first look deal or something that we have some deal with netflix they own it like if i get hit by a bus tomorrow it would make no difference they, they own they own this forever you know like my children will not inherit these things this is they will get the money you know they've got the cash but like uh, but they, they will not own these characters these are owned in the same way that warner brothers owns superman and marvel owns uh sorry disney owns all the marvel characters so um you know, but they asked me to stick around. You know, they wanted me um, to to stay on for a certain number of years, um, and I and, and they wanted me to like plot out because quite often I only read the first volume of something. So something like uh, I don't know, you know, what's a good example? Um, like Chrononauts. There was one volume of Chrononauts, and they were like, "Well, we'd kind of like to do a trilogy of these." You know, like could you stick around and write the plots? You know, the scriptments for the next three, the next two. And I was like, yeah, I'd like to do that, but I don't want to just disappear. I said, I really love doing comics. And I didn't get into comics to get into Hollywood. You know, I mean, I love Hollywood. It's, I'm, I'm not ungrateful about it at all. But I really love comics. Like, I, I have a good DVD collection. I have a great comic collection. You know, like, I, I, I love comics. Uh, I buy a, a lot more comics than I buy DVDs, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to still have some kind of presence in comic books. So... I said, look, this is going to sound crazy, but can I still do some of them as comic books? You know, I know you're not in the publishing game or anything, but can I just continue, maybe do half of them or two thirds of the things that I'm working on, do them as books? They were like, we don't care, do, do what you like, you know? So I've given myself all this extra work. I don't get paid extra money for it or anything, you know, I just do it later. I mean, my, my salary would be exactly the same whether I did it or not, you know? Um, but I, I said to them, like, the, the time I'm at Netflix, I want to just do these books. So for me, it's just pure love, you know, like I just, have a good time doing it. I just enjoy it. You're one of the most yeah. successful. I mean, this this plan it gets talked about a lot of conventions with other creators around. You know, this comics are a stepping stone to Hollywood, and I can't wait to get to yeah. Hollywood. I mean, I've heard that repeated over and over from people. And yeah. what's funny is you are absolutely one of the people that people bring up all the time of being the successful story. You're the you're the person who did it. Yeah, but kind of what you just said. You you never you didn't intend to do it. You <laughs> your love no, your I do great. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was crazy. Like, like Hollywood sort of knocked my door in 2003 and bought Wanted, you know? And I was like, wow, you know, I, I didn't expect this. You know, this is crazy. So, but the stuff I do is quite high concept, quite cinematic, quite simple ideas. You know, there's a good, basic, easy to understand idea beside it. Like, what, what if a kid who didn't have superpowers tried to be a superior? You know, people can like, get their head around this stuff pretty easy, as opposed to, you know, some European album or something, a 26 volume thing that, is super dense or whatever, you know. So it's, it's an easy translation for, for screenwriters and directors are attracted to my stuff, you know. Um, but, but yeah, I never I never saw it as my ultimate destination, you know. And it's funny, my wife, like, she's a normie, you know. I mean, she she didn't read comics until she met me. 
um, and she pretty much only reads my stuff, you know. So like, <laughs> but she, uh, but she can't quite understand it. She's like, you know, you'd have a lot more free time if you didn't do these comic adaptations of the stuff you're doing at Netflix. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I, I love doing comics, and and I do slightly pine. I always say to her, oh, I've got this really good idea for a Justice League story or a Green Lantern story, you know. And she's like, why, why, why do you want to do that? She doesn't quite get it, you know. But but you have to grow up drawing these characters in your bedroom your whole childhood, you know, to understand them, you know, it's, it's, the, the, there's just an, in, there's an ingrained love that we cannot fake, you know, that we can spot a phony, a mile of coming into comics as a grift, as they try and get their show going on, 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 on an American uh, uh, studio. And, and for, for me, it's all, you know, when I'm 80, I'll still be sitting doing comics, whether anybody's reading them or not. You know? It's, uh, yeah. it's, no, it's brilliant. I, I, um, I mean, the Netflix, uh, the Netflix deals, that's fascinating to me. So, so technically, kind of what you're saying is you could just stop and yeah. you're, getting, you're getting the same check. You're working for Netflix. Everything's fine. Exactly the same way. There's not even if, if Magic Order, I mean, Magic Order does well, you know, but when the TV show comes out, it's going to be massive. The show's going to be brilliant, right? I will not get one extra cent from the trades. You know, it's like mm. the, the, guy, wow. the guys, the guys are like, you're mad. Why are you doing this? And I was like, because I love it. You know, I just, I like doing this. Because you know, the, you're not this, only doing it. I, I, when I read your newsletter and and you have your Substack and you you, you, yeah. you the, the thing I, that that always strikes me is you sound so excited about the oh, news yeah. you're making. An artist that you get, whatever it is, you are genuinely the most excited guy in the room. There is nothing better than getting a page of Travis Charest or Frank Quitely oh. or something. You know, it's like when, when I see the rushes, like the American Jesus TV show, uh, the first season is filmed, just about finished filming just now over in Mexico. It's got our couple of weeks left. Um, the Chosen One's the first first series of it. Um, I love getting the, the rushes through for that. I get to see, you know, what the actors have been doing and everything. It's so exciting. But it's at least as exciting to get a page in from Travis Charest. I think it's because Travis has done so little over the years. You know, you hardly see any Travis pages, don't you? Um, and when something comes in, like even my wife and other people in the office who didn't read comics, they were like, oh my God, there's a page from Travis Shereston, you know? It's like, it's really exciting, you know? And and I think the minute you don't feel that, you should do another job, you know? Like, because people are paying three ninety nine dollars for these comics, you know? It's, yeah. they're, they're, yeah. These are expensive. You should, you should be bringing your A-game to every single page that you write or you should go. You know, you, know, you, you brought up something before, I just want to backtrack slightly you, you were talking about your, your stories are simple and, and for a lot of people or, or you know the concept simple or, or things like that for a lot of people that's like a bad word that they avoid when they're talking yeah. about their work and they think of it as like an insult or, or something yeah. like that and you see a lot of of concepts and things you, you see the big things like oh high concept we have to try yeah. to do these mm -hmm. really hard to wrap your head around kind of ideas and you see that popular in comics but it's not resonating with fans in the same way uh, there are exceptions but in yeah. general and but but for years and years that's still ingrained and that's still what people are doing and pushing and yeah. and and why do you think there's such a a disconnect in that you're you're telling stories that you would self-describe be like oh it's a simple concept but or with the twist and that people aren't going more for, for what you're doing like that. Um, do you know, I think some people undervalue simplicity, you know, like I, I think that yes. Jaws is the simplest idea in the world. You know, you could show Jaws to people who, you know, don't speak English, you know, like have never seen a movie in their life and you get it, you know, it's a simple yeah. idea. It's a village is under threat. People are getting killed. Three men get together and go and kill the beast. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, these the, the best stories are myths and myths are simple, you know. So so I, I like to strip it down and, and make it as accessible as possible. I, I like to do really simple panel arrangements as well. I don't like to get too crazy because I don't know if you guys find this, you know, when you're at school and you're loving a comic book and you'd be like, This is amazing, read this. I don't know if you were I was like a drug pusher, you know, I was like passing these books on the and okay. people are like, I don't even know how to read. I don't know what way my eyes are supposed to go and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And I always remembered that, you know, that People didn't understand the language of comics. We were pretty sophisticated because we read a lot of comics. So I, I try and make it as simple as possible. And I like to work with artists who can make it so simple that a 95-year-old grandmother can pick it up and understand mm -hmm. it. 
It's funny you say that yeah. because I, I think it's it's not inherent to comics. There there's certainly plenty of comics that are laid out and brilliant artists and writers that that take a page yeah. and you pick it up and it's intuitive and natural and the user experience yeah. is great. And then there's others that, that aren't. And it, it's I I've I've had that conversation in the shop many times from parents of like, well, we I don't know how to teach my kids how to read a comic. It's like you don't need to actually. You just need to get the right comic. Here, try this one. Yeah. Will, you yeah. don't need to teach. Yeah. Just read this one. It's good. Yeah. Um, but I like that. I mean, the simplicity. It, it is true. There's this. There's this almost negative backlash against a simple concept. Like it, we have to overcomplicate it. But the, there's never any big financial proof that that works out. Like, <laughs> no, and and it's why the Hollywood guys love my stuff. You know, like the studios. There was not none of my, even before I sold the company. Nothing wasn't option somewhere and in development somewhere you know because they got it you know like is that one line idea you know i mean i've never had to pitch anything you know people hear the concept and they're like cool you know and they, they come and try and get it but you know it's really interesting here's a here's a thought um in lockdown my middle daughter who at the time was eight at the start of lockdown she i've been sort of trying to get her into comics but she wasn't quite uh into it and then weirdly i had one of those, you know, those 500 page Superman omnibuses uh, that came mm -hmm. out about 20 years ago. And they, they were like 10 bucks or something for 500 pages. They were amazing. They were like black and white. And it was 1959 auto binder, uh, like Al uh stories and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I just had it lying around and my kid picked it up. And it was a Lois Lane story, actually, she got into. She read the, the Lois Lane comics used to sell seven or 800,000 copies at their peak. You know, these were yeah. huge comics. And so there was a magic to them, you know, and she picked it up and it was some story about Lois Lane becoming a witch. I think it was the first ever issue of Lois Lane. And she was like, this is amazing. And it was so simple. She just got it, you know, but all the most sophisticated comics, all the stuff that's primarily aimed at adults now, um, she's no interest in at all. So I experimented and I, I showed her a lot of different comic books and almost 100% of the time she loved comics from about 1955 to about 1968. Basically, that period, she almost anything I give her from that period, she loves it. Anything in the seventies, yes. eighties, nothing she hates. You know, she's just no interest in it at all. Modern comics, forget about it. You know, just nothing. So the, there's something. The reason those comics sold millions of copies is that anybody could understand them. There was, there was. They weren't trying to win awards. They were, they, they weren't trying to be cooler. And they were just telling you really funny Superman stories. You know? yeah. yeah. No, I. It's funny you, you say it. So my daughter just turned nine. My younger yeah. daughter. And it's the exact same story. She loves the Silver Age. She yeah. loves those Jimmy Olsen, Lois Lane, the, right. the, the, the wacky stories I enjoy because they're, they're crazy. Yeah. And it breaks my heart a little bit because I love the Chris Claremont X-Men era and kind of all that stuff. But you can't, you, I can't force her to read it. She, just, she, she, she won't do it. My suspicion is that I think that stuff was aimed at everyone. Then the 80s stuff is aimed at a slightly smaller, more niche audience, you know, which was guys like us, you know. Um, but I think if she really loves comics and stays with it, she might migrate to that and evolve into that stuff, you know. And then you you go down the rabbit hole, then don't you? That's it, you're in. But but those stories were aimed at everyone, and they're so undervalued. I think aren't they? They were. I, I remember years ago I was asked um, what was my three top movies, and I said Superman, Star Wars, and Indiana Jones or something. And one of my friends said to me, "You sound like an idiot," you know. They said, "Why don't you?" Leave to pretend it's a French film or something, but I just see you sound more intelligent, you know? But I, I do think there's such an amazing gift of your favorite things being mainstream. You know, like, uh, I think there is a slight cultural sn snobbery, isn't there? You know, that people are a little embarrassed to to love things that everybody yeah. likes. They love to be into the band that nobody's heard of, you know? But I've luckily never had that hipster head. I've always, I've always loved big mainstream things. Well, it feels like the Top Gun effect of people are now admitting that that film was amazing and they're, they're, they're yeah. enjoying it. They're having a good time. They feel like kids again. And so they, yeah. it's, it's almost, it, maybe that's the snap. People are willing to, to just forget all that pretentiousness stuff and just enjoy what they enjoy. Also just cool guys doing cool things and cool planes. You know, it's like, yeah. what's not good to formula. like? You know? Yeah. Right. Great. I mean, Hollywood worked for a long time on pretty much that formula, you know, and, and people, there's a reason that stuff made a lot of money. How uh, so? How approaching the topic of manga? Are you are you reading a lot of manga? Do you like what's what's that impact in your view? Um, I, I have over the years. Um, I'm actually getting more into it now. I'm working my way through Attack on Titan at the moment. You know, oh, really nice. like, mm -hmm. Attack on Titan is fantastic. I absolutely love it. Um, you know, I reread recently Akira, 
And I, I read it when it came out, you know, when, you know, when everybody in the West kind of got into it around about the time of Batman Returns or something, you know, around about 1992 or something, I think it was starting to come out over here. Um, and I, I liked it, but I didn't understand just how brilliant it was. I think I wasn't ready for it, you know. And I'm reading yeah. it again, just now, I'm loving it. And I'm picking up a lot of that classic stuff as well, you know, like My the Psychic Girl and things like that as well, you know. So, oh, right. I mean, I'm probably reading a little more manga than um, American comics at the moment, which is, which is, I guess, I guess what everyone's saying. You know? it, it's no, it's, it's. Yeah. I'm curious what happens with your kids because it, it was surprising to me. You know, growing up in in you know the 80s and 90s, getting your hands on manga, it was hard to do. Yeah. I mean, you, you had to yeah. work at it to yeah. actually just get your hands on it, and yeah. then you had yeah. to kind of break through the cultural barrier of it's it's telling a different story in a different area and everything yeah. else. And there was just you had to kind of commit to the bit. And now, you know, my daughters, as I said, love the Silver Age. The other thing they love is is manga. And they're reading yeah. super dense, you know, uh, slice of life stories about Japanese culture. And they're <laughs> getting it right away. And I'm, I'm curious if your kids are going to have the same effect. It's it's, yeah, it's unusual. My oldest kids, um, she, she was reading My Life as a House Husband and everything. You know, she's reading, yeah. you know, stuff that you can't imagine coming out in the West. But but. It's great, you know, and I, I I love the fact that comics can just be about anything now, you know, like yeah. even even 20 years ago, comics really had to be superheroes. You could maybe have a little bit of horror, you could maybe have a little sci-fi, but it never really worked yeah. massively, you know. But I love yeah. the fact that there's as many copies of my life as a house husband's on a comic shop <laughs> shelf now as there are, you know, Green Lantern or something like that. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. But it's weird. I saw, this, I saw this coming years ago, though, because... My oldest kids, um, I remember she would just sit and draw Dragon Ball Z and all that kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, oh, my God, like Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z is your version of Super Friends and Spider-Man mm -hmm. and his amazing friends and everything, you know? I realized that my influences were Hanna-Barbera and American comic books and everything, you know? But her influences were entirely Asian. And I was like, oh, that's going to be interesting down the line. And when she, when she was 10, 12... And she was drawing pictures of people. They looked like Dragon Ball Z people, you know. Whereas I draw people, I drew people who look like Johnny Romita or characters or whatever, you know. Right. So I, I knew something different was coming because no two generations really are into the same thing. You know, it's, it's really important that the old thing atrophies and goes away, really. You know, in, in a way, it's quite good that they're messing up all of our favorite things, you know. So, like, because yeah. you've got to make way for the new stuff coming through. That's an exciting. It's an exciting time. Well, tell me about tell me about Netflix. You, you do have the Magic Order coming out yeah. relatively soon, right? Uh, when when is when when do we when do we get to see that? Do you mean as a show or as a comic? Well, both both. You have both oh, right. in plan. Right? Um, Ma Magic Order. We we started working on Magic Order actually just before COVID hit, and the sets were built over in Prague, um, and it was really weird, you know, because it was kind of like I mean everybody has this story, but it's kind of like a Stephen King story or something where you're like. What? you know, the, there's people who are getting sick on set, what's happening, you know, like in the production office, half the office had this mystery virus and everything and we were like, oh my god, so the whole thing got closed down, everybody was really scared and didn't know what was coming next and everything, you know, um, and it was obviously COVID, um, so it was an early casualty of COVID but what it did do, um, we actually had 18 months where just everything was frozen, the only people working were writers um, everybody else was just you know, you, you couldn't you didn't know how long this was going to go on for, so nobody could start shooting something because, you know, you might have to halt in three weeks' time or whatever. And that was especially true with American Jesus because it was a mostly young cast of 12-year-olds. Imagine we started shooting, closed down for six months, and then they were all different heights. You know, that was a very practical problem on American Jesus. So we had to wait until we were completely clear of the pandemic before we could be guaranteed 16 weeks, 18 weeks of shooting with these these kids. Um, so so just really odd, practical things like that. Um, so Magic Order, what we did is we looked at it, and I wasn't crazy about the way it was going. You know, I just I felt this could be better. Um, and, you know, there's not many positives to a global pandemic, you know, but actually for people to sit and reassess, and Jupiter's hadn't worked out the way that we wanted it to work, and I was like, I, I feel there should be a, this should be closer to the book, you know, because it was, it was it was doing its own thing a little bit. Um, so it's been rethought, and it's looking fantastic. Like I'm really happy, and it's really weird actually because I never really fancied being an executive, a Hollywood executive. It was never really something that interested me, but I do see the value of it, like sitting in those meetings and saying this isn't right. You know, I'd, I'd rather this 
was six months later and we rethought it and brought someone else in to, to do this. So I've done that with a lot of the films. You know, a lot of the films, um, scripts just weren't right, you know, and, and it's hard to get comic books things right. You know, if you look at the history of comic book movies, until Marvel came along, it was mainly not good, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. so there is a certain way of doing these things to get it right, you know. So so hanging around, I've been such a pain, you know, but I've been like, mm, I think we need to rethink this. I think we need to bring in somebody else and so on, you know. But we're getting there now, which is great. Because I'd rather it took an extra year or two and was perfect, you know. So, so Magic Order is looking great. American Jesus looking great. Magic Order is um, the writers' room will be starting for that very soon. We've got uh, the the showrunners been working on uh, our episodes, um, but the uh, the show I don't know if I'm allowed to say when it's it's the next show after American Jesus, you know. Uh, and then we're doing Huck um, and MPH. You know, they're the this the next things on our slate. You know, this is busy. You know, busy schedule. We we somehow managed to get this far into the interview without talking about trouble. So, yeah. <laughs> how, how how did that happen? It was the weirdest thing. Bill Jameis, who I love, right? Bill Jameis is the mm -hmm. best guy I've ever worked with. I loved working with he and Joe. Uh, they were just great. Bill would have a 100 ideas a minute, right? And Bill um, said to me, I need your help. And I was like, how come? And he said, we're launching the Epic comic book line. We're, we're, we're relaunching Epic within Marvel. And we want to do something that's not superheroes. And that sounds crazy, but back when this was, you know, 18 years ago or whatever, superheroes was kind of the only game in town. You know, there wasn't really much outside of that that was working. We said, so we want one of our big superhero writers, you know, like Yura Bendis, to, um, to tell a love story, a romance comic. And I was like, really? You know, and they said, look, <laughs> please do me this one favor. They said, like, I've given you so many breaks and everything. He says, like, do this one thing for me. And I love Bill, so I was like, absolutely, okay. And he plotted a thing out. You know, so he plotted out a story and it was Aunt May, Aunt May losing her virginity. <laughs> thing, right? so, so I was kind of like, okay, that's kind of interesting. I'm in, you know. And, uh, and so he had this story about how Aunt May was Peter's real mom and everything, you know. And uh, it was crazy. And I was like, Bill, this is madness. But weirdly, it sold, it sold like 60,000 copies the first issue. It didn't yeah. surprisingly well. It, yeah. it, it, so <laughs> last time I looked at it, it was over 80,000, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I maybe went back and did reprints. But I remember seeing the first initial sales coming in. And I was like, what? You know? But I yeah. think people just didn't know what to expect. You know, I was, I was doing the Ultimates. I was doing... Um, the Ultimate War, the big crossover, and everything that was doing Ultimate X Men. So I think people just thought, let's order high, see what happens, you know. So um, it, but, uh, yeah. it held. I should do the sales analysis of that it held actually fairly well. It's it's funny because Trouble, I had such an amazingly good time reading that. I mean, it, it recently, uh, I, I did yeah. some videos, and people are like, "Oh my god, this is what what this is terrible, Aunt May? What is she doing? <laughs> like you can't." <laughs> but it was fun. It was it was it was it was absolutely insane. It it now. It's not canon, or what do you, what do you say? Uh, do you know I've never reread it actually? You've made me want to read it again. Though. I think I'm going. I'm going to go and check this out. I'm, you know the the Dodsons are great. The artwork is really okay. nice. I'll, I'll see right, it maybe so as a prequel to my Marvel Knights Spider Man. I did with Terry. Maybe it's a prequel to that. <laughs> so I've been a disembodied voice, but this would be the thing to do the live, you know, on camera. I'll fly over there. We'll go get a pint. Yeah. We'll take the, a little webcam and we'll read this book together. It'll be amazing. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Do you know, does it, um, like, I can't remember what happens after the first issue. Like, what's the big plot twist? Is it, I mean, how on earth did I sustain that story for five issues? Where does it go? Well, I the, the plot twist was that Aunt May was Peter's mom. I think that was the, they, they yeah. it all led up to that. Yeah. Did I, did I actually have that in the story? Like, at the end? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 I need to read this. I mean, it's, it's weird. I think I've memory hold this whole thing because I, I honestly remember nothing. But I do remember the artwork was good. The artwork was nice. Oh yeah, no, oh, it looks great. Yeah. The story was funny. It was, it was, it was. But it's, it's like the Silver Age. It's one of those things that you can enjoy it, and it, you're not meant to take it seriously. You're not really supposed to mentally think about Aunt May being uh, pretty loose. I mean, that's not really. That's you don't you well, don't dwell on that. You just enjoy the comics. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I like to think about that. You know, so. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> how about we 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 talked about the show? How about Magic Order the comic? And 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 you you obviously just completed. 
Or is there yeah. more magic for the comic coming? Oh my god, yeah, yeah. We're going, we're, yeah. we're planning this as a multi-season show, you know. Um, mm-hmm. so I'd actually planned five volumes of the comic. I was thinking maybe six, but I think I can do it in five. I love to not have any fat if I can, just like tell the story that needs to be told and then get out of town. Um, so five volumes for me is quite a lot. You know, that's more than mm-hmm. Ultimates, more than Ultimate X-Men, way more than Old Man Logan and everything. Um, even Kick-Ass is only three volumes, four volumes. Um, yeah, four but, volumes yeah. um, but five, five of Magic Order, um, I've already written three and four. I wrote them last year. Uh, one has been drawn right now by Gigi Cavanego, and he's fantastic. For anyone who doesn't know the story, um, it's basically kind of Dirty Harry Potter, somebody called it, you know, which is kind of... Wizards for adults, really, you know. So mm-hmm. it's about there's a reason we've never seen a ghost before, and it's there's this secret order of people who make the world nice and rational. So we go to work and we sleep in our beds and we don't see monsters or ghosts because these guys are taking care of it. And they live among us, you know, as garbage collectors and checkout operators and bus drivers, just regular people. Um, but we don't know at night time to take care of all this stuff. So it's going to be a really big show. Um, and the comic has worked out really well. I had Olivier Coipel do the first volume, Stuart Eminem, do the second volume. Now, Gigi Cavanego, uh, the one that's out this uh, coming week. Oh, no, it's next week, actually, a week in Wednesday. I think it's the 25th of the month. Um, so Magic Order uh, Volume 3 begins. A perfect jumping on point for anyone. If you like comics, you'll love it. That's that's my, mm-hmm. my pitch to it. But it's, it's beautifully drawn as well. I mean, it's fantastic. And I've, I've written Volume 4, and Volume 4 is half drawn as well. It's done by an amazing Marvel artist called DK Ruan. Who's mm-hmm. fantastic? He's he's amazing. Um, so that's looking great. We're going to run Magic Order three and four just together, you know. And then by the okay. time Magic Order four finishes, we'll have the, the the show. So there'll be four four volumes will be out by the time the show appears. That's and and you've made a big deal lately, kind of to to the thing we mentioned earlier. You've you I, I love it when you announce it. Like we've we've stolen another artist from Marvel <laughs> and DC. I, I, I love was, a smash and grab. I love a smash and grab. My two biggest deals ever. From Marvel and DC, um, I'm going to announce. It. I'm not quite sure when I'm going to announce it. I think I'll announce it in the next few weeks. But the guys are both deep into the comics now. You know, one of them is doing a, a, a the new Nemesis book. I've got a new Nemesis book coming out at the end of the year. And the, the best possible guy I've stolen for that one is looks awesome. Um, and then I have a, a huge project, the biggest project I've ever done. I mean, and you'll understand why I'm saying this whenever you you see what the announcement is. But the biggest project I've ever done, I've got. Marvel's biggest artist I stole, and he's he's two issues into that now, you know. But it's great. I'll be out next summer, and it's just worked out beautifully. I'm really, really happy with it. So we've got there's a few interesting things. I mean, Prodigy um, is a movie we're doing um, in the film department. Um, the first volume of that came out a couple of years back. The second volume has just appeared. It's called The Echidus Society, so it's in shops now. Round about, I think we're looking at a. About October, we've got the final book of American Jesus coming out. Uh, then Nightclub, my vampire superhero thing, uh, is out the following month, I think. And then we have Nemesis. Uh, so it's a busy, busy year. There's a lot of big books coming, you know. So um, yeah. it's quite nice because yeah. I've been stockpiling them for a little while. And again, uh, you know, Netflix are like, what, what are you doing? Why are you working so hard? You know, and I, but I just, I'm having a great time with that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what what you know, are the answers? When you, you just love comics, though. That's, yeah. and, and do, do, how many, do people, do a lot of people just get that? Or are they just, they shake their heads and like a crazy guy? Comic fans get it. You know, if you're a comic fan, you get it. You know, like all my, my peers, you know, they, I mean, I, I'm still in touch every day with most of the guys I've ever worked with. You know, like we're great friends. Because yeah. comics is kind of a little international club, isn't you know, it? You know, we talk. You know, or the, you know, we we you have people you have international relationships with who have who share the same passions. You know, you're you're really into mm-hmm. the stuff, so it's fun to talk about it. And everybody trades thoughts and where things are going and what the trends are and everything. You know, it's cool. So those guys get it. They're like, well, of course. Why would you not do comics? It's awesome doing comics. You know, but I think my normie friends can are uh, like, why are you still doing this? You know, like, and even my wife, like I say. Every week I come up with a new idea for a Marvel or DC thing, you know, and she's utterly baffled by it, you know, because I mean, for me it's never about the door, you know. It's like, and for Steve it's not. I mean, Steve's right back into Marvel, you know. Like, he doesn't care. Yeah. He just loves drawing Marvel characters. And yeah. you, it, it's, you have to be a comic guy to understand it, don't you? You know, it's like nothing would make me happier than writing a Superman comic. That would that, be my idea of a great week, you know. 
Yeah. You know, uh, since you're bringing this stuff up, you know, and you, you touched on some of the books you, you enjoyed growing up, but like, um, yeah. who, who were some of the first, like, um, I, I know you mentioned like Jack Kirby and like Roy mm -hmm. Thomas and some others, but who were some of the first like writers and artists, like you started to be like, Oh, I want to get this book because yeah. I know this artist or this writer is, is on it. That's a great question because there's actually a period in your life and every comic fan's life when you suddenly realize, oh, it's not just Batman I like, I like Doug Munch or I like Jerry Conway or whatever, you know, it's like, so for me, actually, it was a guy called Carrie Bates who yeah. I've, I've recently actually managed to contact, which I'm so excited about because Carrie wrote Superman and The Flash in the 1960s and 1970s into the mid 80s. And then he went off to Hollywood to work on the Superboy TV show. And, and he was writing Superman 5, actually, at one point as well. He'd written a script for Superman 5. Um, so Carrie was the first person who I thought, you know when you read a comic and you like it, and then you go back and you reread it as a kid, and you're like, this is awesome. And then you've read it like five times. And I started to notice that the guys, the guys I was rereading were the same people. So Jerry Conway, Carrie Bates, Elliot Magan, you know, these, these names kept popping up. And of course, Stan Lee, you know, like, yeah. obviously. But I, I then started to follow writers, so then I heard Carrie Bates wrote The Flash. So I then picked up The Flash based on Carrie, not because of a cool costume or superpowers or whatever. And then by the time you're a teenager, you're following creators, aren't you? You know, like, you suddenly stop trying to get every issue of Spider-Man in sequence because maybe there's a bad three-year run. You think, I, I can't afford to buy a bad book. The writer I used to like is over here doing Hulk now or something like that, you know? So, yeah. so you right. move around, don't you? So I, I could always afford about five comics a month. So I tended to just follow my, my favorite people. Do you think uh, in, in all of the comics you've written, you've written tons of different things, tons of, you know, all, all companies, uh, certainly your own stuff now. Uh, was there an idea that you pitched that was so crazy and extreme they shot you down that you just you still would love to do this day? Um, not so much that it was so crazy. That, um, I, I couldn't quite connect with DC. It was funny. Like My whole life I wanted to work at DC. Like I, I'd say the way my... My love has fluctuated over the years, right? When I was a little kid, like really little kid, I loved Superman and Batman. Then, mm -hmm. by the time I was about seven, I loved Spider-Man and the Hulk because they were on TV and everything, you know? Um, but then Superman came along with it, Superman the movie, and then I, I was a DC guy pretty much from then on, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so DC was kind of my thing, and uh, I always saw it as the summit of my aspirations. I always thought one day I would love to work at DC Comics. That was my, I told the careers officer in school, that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't anything except writing the DC characters. But when I got there, it, was, it wasn't a really fun environment. You know, it was actually quite, you know, there was a, it felt a bit like jail, you know, when, when I got there. It really, it felt very corporate. And I was kind of surprised because I was so excited to get in there, you know. And the editors all seemed a little, not all of them, but a lot of them were just a little unhappy and some of them were getting bullied and things, you know, and it was it was a very corporate environment um, and it wasn't the fun thing I wanted, you know, there was a lot of weird power plays between people and everything and I, I didn't know what to do because it was the only thing I'd ever wanted to do, you know, and I was like, why am yeah. I not connecting here? This is strange. And what was weird was when I went to Marvel, even though I wasn't a huge Marvel fan, like I loved certain elements of Marvel growing up, like Frank Miller's sure. Daredevil or Roy Thomas's Avengers and things, but um, when I went to Marvel, it just clicked, and I was suddenly among my people. You know, it's you know they say find your tribe. You know, like find yeah. you, like like it, no matter how cool you are, whatever. If you're in the wrong group, it, you're going to feel like an outsider. You know, it's not going to be for you, and, and you're going to have a horrible time. But if you can actually find where you should be, it's a really wonderful thing in life. And and at that point in time, Marvel was just perfect for me. It was such a nice working environment. Uh, I had fun every day. You know. Um, and I haven't stopped since. Yeah. I wonder, just kind of speculating. I, I I I agree completely with with what you said. I think I think the magic in life is that you find your people, and yeah. it's not always what you think. And in many cases, I, I watch the current state of the industry. Often feels like people, talented people, are just in the wrong tribe. And if you could just go yeah. and shuffle them around a bit get them where they belong, you, the, everybody would be happier, the work would be better. It just it feels like there's a lot of grinding at the moment with people who are just not in the right spot. 
I think there's a yeah. few things going on. You know, I think um, a very simple problem I think could be solved if they didn't do these exclusives. Like, mm-hmm. I'd be really, I'd be. Imagine everybody at Marvel and everybody at DC, or everyone you've associated with Marvel and everyone you've associated with DC for the last twenty years, change places. I mean, just as simple yeah. as that. You know, if you if you suddenly had these guys drawing the DC characters and these guys drawing the Marvel characters and the writers just. I think they would feel refreshed and the readers would feel really refreshed as well. You know, like to see Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo doing X-Men, I'd be like, holy cow, that would actually be amazing. You know, and it'd be a really good fit. They would both, I think, be excellent on that. You know, I think Scott's quite cerebral. You know, he's good at doing uh, that that type of story. Um, He's he's quite an intellectual writer. Uh, Capullo is born to draw X-Men, really. You know, he draws draws Great Wolverine and everything, you know. But then, Mm -hmm. you know, imagine... Stuart Emin and over and, and Jason Aaron over doing Superman or something, you know, it, it'd be awesome, you know. So I think you can stay at the same company too long. I, I think after about seven, five to seven years, I think you must get out of a company. You know, I think you have to go somewhere else and recharge your batteries just to have different people around you. I think as well because you you you're, you're inspired by your peers and uh, and the people you work with. It's huge, huge how it affects uh, what you do. And, and I don't just mean in comics; I mean in everything. One of my friends is a great theory. He said. That you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with, whether that's positive or negative or whatever. And I think there's really yeah. something in that, you know. So if you hang around with a bunch of dumb people, very quickly you'll be dumbed <laughs> down. It's inevitable, you know. Um, and and I think if if you can be inspired by the people around you, you're going to bring your best work. And you know, yeah. so I, I think that'd be number one. That's the first thing yeah. that I think that makes Marvel and DC shaking it up a lot. It's, it's, I mean, what you say is very common in the business world. If you're in consulting, in tech, pharma, you know, yeah. that exact philosophy is, is a given that people should yeah. move around and they need to explore other things. It, it's, it's interesting to me. And I think we've talked about this before. Just there's some basic business fundamentals that apply completely to comics, but, but yeah. in some cases, comics resist very basic business life advice that, you know, I, for, for unknown reasons, well, it also goes a bit tribal, you know, like I, I've got pals that work at Goldman Sachs or Deloitte or something like that, you know, and mm-hmm. like nobody sees it as a personal slight when they go elsewhere. They're like, oh, my God, they're offering you more money over at Goldman. Go, go there, you know, and it's like, yeah. whereas in comics, like it is weird, you know, like if you jump shit, people really get upset, you know, they really take it personally, you know, and, and mm-hmm. Marvel and DC has become sort of two tribes Like these guys don't always have dinner together and all that. You know, I think in the past they did, you know, and there was a real fluidity between um, the companies Like somebody would do two years at Marvel, then we'd go over and do three years at DC and everything, you know, in the past. And I think that's really healthy. It's also a very good way of bumping up your pay trade because you can, I mean, the, the companies want to polarize you because they can keep you on a crazy pay trade. I mean, we pay so much more than Marvel and DC, you know, the, our Miller World books. Um, and I'm astonished how low some big name people are being paid at Marvel and DC. Like people who've been on the same rate for 15 years, I think it's absolutely oh, yeah. insane. Who are brilliant at what they do, but if they they see the Marvel or DC editors as their friends and they don't want to let them down, and I was like, if they were your friends, they'd pay double, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. But if you go to the competition, you can jack up your page rate and then jack it up again when you come back. Yeah. No, I think I and I, I I'm, it is all business. I'm sure. I have a friend who's working over there now and, and kind of said, I, I'm being paid this. Do you think I'm being paid unfair? And I'm like, I, we're way past unfair. You're, 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 yeah. you're, you're in a crazy town is where you're at. Uh, honestly, um, go, go wait tables. You'll be, it, it, you stop, stop it. It's not fair to you. I, I don't know. I'm, 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 oh, sorry. I was going to say the other thing to do, which is genius, is they'll keep people on the same page rates for 15 years. And then they say, Oh, listen, it's really bad form to discuss your page rate with anyone. And it's and it's such an amazing uh, an amazing stunt because what it does is it stops people from realizing how low their page rate is compared to yeah. some other people, you know? So it's, it's not. So I, I've always been a big advocate of getting people to talk about their page rate because it's a great way of not getting ripped off. It's a healthier industry. If people are paid more, they're supporting themselves better, they're happier, they're able to. I mean, it's just all these things domino. I think it's it's critical that, that it's it's better yeah. for the publishers. And I, I agree. If they would allow some swap like that, I mean Marvel and DC would make more money. I mean it would be good for both companies. I mean, I, I suggest that, I mean I'm I'm still friends with all the guys at Marvel and everything, and I, I did say, like, why don't you have one year where you do a trade-off? 
you know, literally everybody jumped ship for a year and how exciting that would be. And they said, well, our guys are kind of better than their guys and all that, you know, and like, but you, I don't know. I, I think there's no benefit from it. It's weird that Marvel would say something like that. Well, that's, that's uh, not surprising. Well, they everyone wow, thinks I'm teasing. Yeah, yeah no, no. Everyone thinks they're, they're always going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm sensitive to your time. So we've been talking for an hour. It's late over there. You're doing this late in the day, and I, I, kids are asleep, you, right? And every five minutes I'm with you is five minutes. My wife hasn't asked me to do something, you know. So this is fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm not doing any <laughs> family responsibilities. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I did uh, like a couple more just quick things. The, the Civil War, so this this mm -hmm. this Civil War that obviously sold a lot more. I I'm fascinated, and every about once a year I go back and I read. I've got the, the hardcover with all the original notes. Um, I think it's yourself and Tom and Joe are kind of going back yeah. and forth, and you're giving your original pitch. I've heard from you know multiple writers now. It's easier to pitch for Hollywood than pitch for comics. Is that true from your perspective? Um. I, I see. I, I think I've been very lucky in comics for twenty years. You know, I know it was certainly the case in my twenties. Like you know, once you have a hit, you're given a certain amount of leeway. You know, where they trust you. Yeah. You think, well, it's kind of like the stock market. You know, they'll put their money where the confidence is. So they think, well, this guy had a hit. I'll invest in his next thing. This guy's had four hits. I'll go for his next three projects. You know, whereas I'd say it's very, very hard your first ten years. You know, maybe not so much now. But for me, the first 10 years was really hard. I mean, I was just writing pitch documents all the time in my 20s. And I was, I'd was i say one week of the month I was writing script that I was getting paid for and three weeks of the month I was writing pitches that were being turned out. And it was really hard, you know. I mean, 75% of your day being pointless is quite, is quite difficult, you know. But the <laughs> one silver lining to it is a lot of that stuff ended up becoming big Miller World projects, you know. So... Okay. Secret Society of Supervillains got knocked back from DC. So then I rejigged it and I pitched it to Marvel as um, a thing with their supervillains called the Shocker, you know, the Spider-Man villain, the Shocker. And they mm -hmm. knocked it back as well. So then I rejigged it and made it wanted. And it started my Hollywood career, you know. So like, so sometimes being knocked back is, is a wonderful thing, you know. Yeah. So it, it makes you tough as well. You know, you shouldn't have it too easy when you start, you know. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, speaking of Civil War uh, as well, um, so I, when when Goliath gets killed off by yeah. the, the clone Thor and all that, and then they have the funeral and he's like gigantic, was, was that <laughs> intentionally dry humor of having the gigantic corpse of, of Goliath being dead? Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally, yeah. Well, I just thought it was a good question. Because <laughs> if, if he died at 75 feet tall, they can't shrink him down, so they have to do this ridiculous uh, <laughs> <Just> helicopter funeral. <laughs> it's funny actually because people don't know all the stuff that goes on in the background, but whenever you kill a character at Marvel, it's a big deal within the company because you can't just pick someone because somebody might have a six issue mini series with this guy or a 12 issue story arc in X Men that this guy's starring in or something, you know? So you actually have to go to a committee. There's a kind of a death committee, really, you know, where you say, listen, who, who can I get? So I was given a list of like, I think for that particular scene, there was six characters I was given when I was plotting it out, you know? And they gave me six characters and I picked Goliath because he was the only one I'd heard of. Like the other five I, I literally never heard of, you know? And uh, the same thing happened when I, John Romita and I did Wolverine. I was doing Wolverine Enemy of the State, and I had to kill somebody off there. And it was uh, North Star. Um, right. He was on a list and again, a list of six. He was the only one I'd ever heard of. You know, so I, I thought for the most dramatic death, you know, it's got to be somebody who's semi well known. You know, so um, so yeah, it's, it's it's weird. You know, you have to. I mean, it's a big corporation. Somebody might have a movie coming out with that character. You know? Yeah. Ironically, the uh, rebirth uh, committee is much smaller and faster, apparently. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that list. Uh, that would be <laughs> the characters passed over that uh, we picked Goliath for. I'm like, back eh, cloak was in there, maybe, and some, <laughs> just, <laughs> some of these other. It, you know, it, it, I thinking about comics to movies trends. Obviously, you're you're very much in the in the heart of that. Um, it strikes me that the, the MCU, the Marvel movies, seem to make yeah. a real effort for a brief period of time to recreate some of those scenes. So several of you are kind of iconic. Obviously, the Civil War, the movie, is very different from the comic. But yeah. still, they, there was an effort to kind of recreate some of those scenes. 
Oh yeah, um, I mean, but the, it, first, the first Avengers movie is you know almost scene for scene, Ultimates issue one to thirteen, you know, so with a little yeah. bit in Captain America as well, you know, like the World War Two stuff. But I mean, the guys were very open about it, you know. It's very flattering. It's it's nice, like uh, Zach Penn. You know, said that they just basically sat the ultimates out and they translated it when they were doing the screenplay for it. And Louis Leterrier had contacted me that he was the original director, which a lot of people don't know. He was going to direct the Avengers movie originally. Yeah. John Favreau mm-hmm. was first choice, I think, and then Louis came in when John left. Um, and they wanted me to come in and work on it with them and everything. But by that point, um, I had Miller World sort of up and running a little and everything, you know, and I just I was focusing on my own stuff. Um, but yeah, it's always really fun, you know. I mean, I, I'm very relaxed about it because Stan, Stan Lee was uh, the one who said to me years back, 20 years ago almost now, he said, you must go and do your own thing because otherwise they're just going to adapt all of your things and not pay you, <laughs> you know. And <laughs> and I was like, that's good advice, you know. Because I was so happy just writing, you know, big Marvel comics and everything. And he was like, no, no, if I had your opportunity, imagine what me and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko could have done if we could have kept the trademark copyright on, on our characters. He said, get out there and do your own thing. He said, uh, you must do it. Um, so I did. Um, and it was great advice because I did enough stuff at Marvel that Hollywood noticed me and, you know, liked the stuff right. and everything. But I was able to go on and carve out my own career. So I so I never looked back on that as a sort of, you know, like I ripped off or anything like this. You know, I just think I was paid well, had a great time. And it kick-started my career, gave me an audience really that I could take on to other things. Yeah. And Netflix has been good for you, good to you. You they 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 treat you really well and they listen to your advice. It's insane. You know, like I uh, I mean, I've been there five years almost five years now, like in August that'll be five years. Um and you know, I mean our our life is radically different. You know, we sold our company to them and everything, and it meant we could do all these things that I never imagined we'd be able to do, you know, like like members of the family. I mean, I've got a gigantic family, people I could help out with things and stuff like that. You know, like somebody needed a house or something like that. You know, you could do these crazy things that you weren't able to do. Or I could go back and sort of put money into my my town that I grew up in and everything, you know, that kind of stuff. So it was all these dream sort of lottery win type things, which was amazing, you know. It's, it's been brilliant, you know. Um, and every day I get to just work with the comic artists that I want to work with, you know, and we hopefully turn them into good good shows and movies, you know, like like I said, Jupiter didn't work out the way we wanted it to. Um, I, I was actually a little bit, I only really kind of come in at the end because originally my plan was just to kind of like be like Stan Lee, you know, and just come in and, you know, say hello and everything, you know, and, and then I, I realized after that, you know, I should be more involved, you know, and like, uh, you know, I've tried to kind of just make, things as good as they possibly can be, you know, ever since. COVID was weird because we had two years where we couldn't really get much done, but what we've done in the last 12 months has been crazy. You know, I'm, I'm really delighted with the way everything's looking. I love the way the books are looking. It's been a really happy time. I've, I've just really loved it. And the people I'm working with are fantastic. Like, it's weird. Like, Netflix has got the best legal department. They've got the best accounts department, the best marketing people and everything, you know. I've always been a lone wolf, really. You know, even when I worked at Marvel, I, I would do my own PR. I used to send stuff out to comic stores and all that kind of stuff and everything myself. But you did. you've got yeah. you've got this this machine behind you, you know, like Netflix is the biggest media company in the world. So if, if you need something in Hollywood Reporter or Variety or something, it's there tomorrow. You know, that kind of stuff. It's it is crazy. You know, to be inside the machine is a sight to behold. It's amazing. And you get you get so much you get so much cool stuff. Like see when you go to a meeting, this is going to sound tiny, right? But I love this. When you go to a meeting, there's a canteen where it's just endless free food, right? So And it's open 24 hours a day, so nobody has to pay for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and everything, right? And as a cheap Scotsman, right, I love this. So whenever I go into a meeting, I always kind of see... All, I, I, I go into a meeting with, like, 10 cans of Coke and, like, 15 Kit Kats and everything, you know, and people are like... I'm like, do you not realise this is free? You should all get as many cans of Coke as you can. This is good. They're not charging as much. <laughs> I remember that brief period when, uh, like EA and some of the game companies would have like the open taps and kegs in their office, and it was like, yeah. "This is amazing." And then, like, and about six months later, it's like, "All right, well, we're shutting that down because <laughs> there's, there's a side effect too." But to that, people are people are certainly enjoying that. Um, no, it's a, you're, 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 so you've got a really good run coming up. You've got comics obviously out right now, and it sounds like a, a full slate of just you're just keeping rolling with that. And then on at Netflix, it sounds like you're, you're getting close to where you're going to have pretty steady series out for quite some time. 
Yeah, well, American Jesus, um, the three volumes of that will be three seasons. Magic Order, um, if it's as big as we hope, will be five seasons, you know. So, I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of these things, you know, and the, the movies um, will, will be out a little bit later than that. Um, and then there's actually still a couple of things out at other studios. So Kingsman, obviously, like uh, in Kick-Ass, um, I still own. We didn't sell them to Netflix, so I, I still have a you know, a piece of the ownership of that. Um, so strangely, you know, Matthew's off doing all these Kingsman TV shows and all this kind of stuff. I, mm-hmm. I can't work on these things anymore, sadly, because I'm at a different studio. But um, Matthew's busy with those. He's got kick-ass plans. And we've got Starlight mm-hmm. over at um, 20th Century as well, you know, like I said, with Joe Cornish. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole ton of these things. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time. You know what, though? I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, comics has got its problems just now and everything. But at the same time, we're also in a period where you can write a comic about anything and potentially find an audience, which is crazy, yeah. isn't it? You can read a comic on your phone almost anywhere in the world. There's we talk about needing to get back into Seven Elevens. We can we can be in Timbuktu reading these things on our phone now. You know, it's like it's insane. And at the same time, Hollywood and all these merchandising people are coming after comic people all the time. It's also at the same time the most wonderful time to ever have been doing this job. I agree. No, it's it's a very odd mix of, of there are certainly problems, um, and I, I get kind of down. Talk, I mean, I, I talk about problems, and I, I hate doing it. Whenever I do it, and I, I happen to look back, and I go days yeah. sometimes, like I'm not going to pay attention to what I posted because it's I know this is a negative run, so I don't want to do yeah. it. But the, there, it's it's like I said, there's there's wonder, there's amazement along with the problems. It is that transition moment, and it's I'm very very hopeful for what's future will bring. Every comic boom is bigger than the last. You know, every tr- every recession in comics is worse than the last as well. But every boom is bigger, and I, I think we're we're gearing up to the biggest boom we've ever had. I've always said it's between twenty twenty six and twenty thirty two. You know, if my chart, I've got a sign graph that I did fifteen years yeah. ago. Um, you know, if this if this chart is correct, we have an amazing run, like I mean, insane run. I think coming up twenty twenty six to thirty two. Um, and it's great. I mean, the one and only downside of comics is probably Twitter. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, everybody just stays off Twitter. Like, I left Twitter about a year ago and it's like the best thing I ever did. Like, on the one hand, it's great because guys like us can connect and everything. I, I love all that. And I'll, I'll have my little secret DMs with people and things, you know, but you just really? got to stay out. I mean, the fact that, you know, they'll be asking somebody who draws the Hulk or something or, or Wonder Woman or whatever. What do you think about quantitative easing? And are you a good guy or a bad guy based on your tax policies and things? It's like you're not running for president. You know, you're you're drawing Spider-Man. And just relax. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I can't be friends with you because you believe this or whatever. You know. I mean, I'll tell you. Can I tell you a really fast story? Like a, a super. Yes, question? please. Yeah. I was on a plane when I was about twenty-seven. I was on a plane beside Ron Mars. You know, Ron Mars, the guy who um, mm-hmm. the comic writer. Um, yeah, of course. Lovely guy, really, really nice guy, and we'd never met. And like, uh, just by pure chance, we were both getting onto the same plane, uh, and we ended up sitting beside each other. It was actually going. I think it was going from San Diego to New York or something like after a con, and um, we'd never met. And we had that five-hour flight, and we just happened to be sitting beside each other, and like, uh, we had the best time. It was great. Mm-hmm. We'd never. We, we, we didn't have any mutual friends, anything like this, but we were both comic guys, right? So we, we had a shared history of comic books and comic-related things like movies and music and magazines and things like that, you know? So we had a shared love of something, and we just talked and had a great laugh the whole way. And we've never seen each other again, but we we, we really got on like a house on fire. And I remember, I've always said to people, Ron Mars is a great guy, lovely, lovely guy. And to me, that's comics. You know, it's like guys from all over the world have this enormous thing in common that they pretty much don't have with anybody in their office at work or anything like this, you know. So why the hell, when you put them together online, do they look for things that make them different from everybody else? You know, I mean, we've got this chance to connect with each other all over the world. So what, what, why on earth are people talking about Trump or <laughs> this kind of thing, you know? We should be talking about all these things that we, we love, you know? And to me, that that conversation, I had such a great time on that five-hour flight. We laughed the whole time. So many great memories. That's what Twitter should be. Comics Twitter should be that, you know. But unfortunately, I think it's sometimes just crazy people, you know, isn't it? You know, who and, and maybe people who are angry you're doing a job, you're working in comics they want to be doing, or you know, they've tried it and it didn't work out, and so they're doubly angry, you know. So I think there's hate mobs emerge, they try and hurt people and destroy people who are doing what they want, you know. So I, I think you're best to just stay out of it. I mean, I, I took advice from a friend a year ago and was like, just just avoid it. You know, I, I've always been quite lucky, but I've seen some people torn 
torn apart by it. But as soon as you step outside of it, you realize, I mean, one of the Disney marketing people told me less than 5% of the comic book audience has an active Twitter account. It's literally yep. meaningless. You know, it's utterly meaningless. You'd be so much better putting a poster in a comic store, you know, for your, for your book. Don't try and promote on Twitter. But it's meaningless. There's an experiment that uh, one of the small companies, I don't know that it's public, so I, I, I'll, I'll keep it anonymous, but one of the small comic companies did where they, they basically spoiled the comic on Twitter completely. And it, was, yeah. it was kind of something they were building. And they did that because they were just curious if anybody would really notice from the buying audience. Yeah. And they, they came up with the same metric that you did. It was like, I think even worse, it was like two and a half, five percent of the people <laughs> had seen it and nobody cared. And it, and and so it is funny, and it is it is also funny that everybody who gets off of it always has the same story. It's like, God, I feel so much better. You know? Yeah, and I, it's, like, I would say comics prior to 2010, prior to Twitter, was generally a happy place. You know, like, you met up at conventions because you really looked forward to seeing your pals who you hadn't seen since San Diego last year or Mid-Ohio Con last year, you know? So, like, when you actually meet in real life, it's great, you know? Like, this, you just got, this should just be a thing that's consigned to the history bin, you know? Like just, just forget yeah. it. Like we, we, we should be out there celebrating comics, not this nonsense. And that's what I it love is, about this guy, Eric, Eric D. July. You know, I, I love his attitude. You know, this guy, he's on track to make three, bill, three, billion, three million from his, uh, yeah. his crowdfunding yeah. campaign. I love it. He's never said a negative about anybody. You know, he's just, he's in there just trying to do his, his best work and everything. You know, I think there's, there's a new adult coming into comics again, I think, that just loves comics. I think that's... And, and success will come from it because it's contagious. Good vibes is contagious. It, no, it will. I, I think success. It, it's I, there. There has been for a long time, even pre Twitter, that this is some kind of inherent jealousy of success. You know, it, it is that that classic. Somebody has something I don't have, and and yeah. it's grumbling about it. But before Twitter, there was really no megaphone to broadcast that everywhere and get people all riled yeah. up. And and now, so it, it it has this very negative effect where you want comic books to succeed, and when somebody does get a good deal. That should be good news. It's it's kind of like the page rate thing. I got a raise, and you can too. Um, but it, it's it, Twitter changes that aspect. It, it flips it, and it, it makes it so that you kind of I don't know the the, the problems are what gets highlighted rather than the successes. And it's it's yeah. anyway. I'm I'm hoping for it yeah. to end soon as well, as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. See, I think your YouTube videos. I love that. I love I love comics YouTube. Comics YouTube's awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate. It. Well, so before. Uh, well, Tom, I, I anything. I'll, I'll ask you for advice because I've looked up for you for years and years. You, you you listen to the show from time to time. What 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 would you like me to do? What what could I do better? Um, I, I this is the honest truth, and I, I I say this to loads of friends as well. I keep I keep videos under ten minutes because like yeah. I, I I listen to videos in my coffee breaks, you know. And if anything goes over ten minutes, I'm like ah, you know, because you you know you feel guilty taking 20 minutes off work, but you don't feel guilty taking 10 minutes off work. I always say to people, keep it lit, you know, like tone it, trim it down, do it in, in 10 minutes. The perfect video is like eight and a half minutes, I think, you know. I would, I would say yeah. keep them all quite short, you know. And you'll get the same sure. point across in that time. But I say that to everyone. Like some of my friends are doing like big three hour ones and I'm like, I'm not even, I'm not even going to try. Like I, I don't have three hours, you know. Like, no, yeah. no, I, I yeah. I mean, so given that, so uh, cognizant of the fact that we've gone well, almost an hour and a half, Mark, <laughs> so I, I legitimately, I've been looking forward to talking to you for well over a year uh, doing this interview. So that, thank you so much. Not I mean, at all. I, you know, I, I just saw the, the percentage on the power is almost gone, so I'm going to run downstairs so I don't just disappear. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> That's the fun of of of, of uh, comics interviews that are live. But but honestly, it's been, it's been wonderful talking with you, and and uh, I hope that this can't be the only time. So I'm I'm serious. I'll oh. come over there. We'll grab we'll Definitely. grab some beer. We'll read trouble. Do you ever come to London? All the time, absolutely. Are you serious? Are you over here? Yeah, yeah. What? I was what in, I was uh, I was over in Geneva just about two uh, less than two months ago. So. I'm, I'm over. Right. I know Geneva is nowhere near London. But so, still. and I've, I've actually weirdly, you'll never believe this. I've bought part of a nightclub in London. I bought part of a nightclub in London, so I'm in London quite a lot. You know, in the Netflix offices, but we'll go to we'll go to the club that I bought, which is crazy. You know, so like, uh, yes. so I, I, we're going to announce it in a, a week or so's time online, and it's going to drive everybody crazy because it's a cryptocurrency club. You know, so. That, and you get a free NFT when you join. So, comics Twitter is going to go into meltdown when they see this. Oh, so, can't wait! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
Well, Mark, thank you very much for, for all the time tonight. And uh, hopefully people enjoyed the, the interview. And Joe, thank you as well. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> we'll talk to you again very Listen, soon. Great seeing you. And I hope, honestly, yeah. I hope when you play this back, it makes sense because when you see my lips moving, it's not so bad. But see, when you just hear my voice, it's, it's, it's horrible. You know, so <laughs> I, I apologize to everyone. <laughs>